God willing, we will hold a press conference in the evening and we will clarify everything and it will be a speech directed to all Libyans. We all, those who support or oppose us, must unite together to build a new Libya. Sami Hamdi is the Managing Director of International Interest and joins us now from London. Sami, always a pleasure to have you on. Uh, is there a good guy or a bad guy in uh, this situation? Does it depend on whether you support the East or the West? I think that's actually a very good question. Uh, I think that more important, I think that the reality is that Libya is in a civil war in which there are really, uh, it's not really a good versus evil. What's happening is that there is this question mark over legitimacy. The elections were failed. Uh, they couldn't hold elections. The Beba is trying to hang on to power for as long as he can. Bashar is trying to bid for power. Haftar is trying to get an ally into Tripoli. Uh, the Beba is trying to, he's rushed to Algiers. He rushed to Turkey. He rushed to uh, his allies and tried to say to them, please continue to support me. And all the while, Washington's stance has been that whoever manages to get themselves into Tripoli and cement themselves in Tripoli, then we will recognize them. And that's why there are talks taking place in Egypt, in Sisi's Egypt, Sisi, who supports Bashar, who supports Haftar. The U.S. has sent Stephanie Williams, uh, the envoy who is supposed to be brokering a new peace agreement to Egypt, to try to broker some sort of negotiation and agreement. And it, it appears in this instance that Egypt and France in particular have been saying to Bashar, look, we've bought you time with these negotiations. The U.S. Have, are essentially waiting to see who has the power. Try and get into Tripoli as quickly as you can. And Bashar, this is the second time he's been trying to get into Tripoli. But what's important to highlight, and going back to your question about good versus evil, is that those who have pushed back Bashar are not entirely the Beba's forces, but rather individual militias who believe that under Bashar, he will, they will not be afforded the umbrella to act independently in the manner that the Beba's government allows them to do so, because the reality in Libya at the moment is that it's a scramble on the part of the militias to establish a power-sharing agreement, and there is this general consensus that elections will not achieve that, and therefore there is this consensus that nobody wants elections, and that's why we see this power struggle today as, as to who can flex the hardest and who can impose themselves in the expectation that Washington will recognize the winner, regardless of elections or not. Sami, you mentioned the militia. I mean, is there an issue here in terms of those who have been fighting for years that they may be worried about accountability, that depending on who comes in as the new prime minister, whatever idea they have of bringing Libya together may be at their cost because of all the possible war crimes and illegal activities that they may have been engaging in during the civil war? I don't think there's anybody in Libya who has their hands clean. And I think this is why, in particular, we see these fault lines that are emerging in that the considerations of the individual militias in terms of who they're going to support are primarily based on two dynamics. The first is whether they can avoid accountability, and the second is whether they can actually get paid by these individual groups. And that's why France and Egypt have actually been able to make headway in Tripoli. They were able to convince some militias v via their own ways to allow access to Bashar into Tripoli. What they underestimated was the backlash from other militias that perhaps they were unable to convince or unable to persuade. Meanwhile, the Beba has been trying to win over these militias by also offering them promises. The emphasis here on offering promises to militias, not offering promises to the people. And I think the, what you say has some truth in it, this idea that the militias are trying to align themselves, essentially saying that we have power, we have guns, nobody can take them off us, so why should we willingly hand them over to elections? Let's all sit together, let's agree to power sharing, let's agree to fiefdoms, let's agree to individual kingdoms, let's split Libya as a cake between us, and we all know that the international community are not interested in democracy. After all, the talks are being held in Sisi where a coup took place. The reality is that let's try to agree between ourselves, and this is where the trouble is in that until now they are unable to come to some sort of agreement as Haftar pushes for more, as Dbeiba pushes for more, as the militias everywhere push for more, and Stephanie Williams is trying to find an agreement that appeases everybody and is unsuccessful to date in achieving that. Sami, where does this leave the people of Libya and their everyday lives? There is a, a, a popular, not a popular, but a famous Arab philosopher who said that when uh, uh, NATO intervened in Libya, the Libyans gave up their country in exchange for freedom. 
The idea being that now they have unrestricted, unregulated freedom that allows militias to do what they want. There is no law, there is no accountability whatsoever. The reality is that the Libyans have no stake whatsoever in what's taking place in Libya. Since the outbreak of the civil war, since the failure of the elections in 2014, the Libyans have been the victims. They've been unable to impose themselves. Every militia does not go to the Libyan people. They go to foreign capitals. They go to Doha. They go to Abu Dhabi. They go to Riyadh. They go to Washington. They go to Paris. Nobody goes to see the Libyan people. And even now, in this current crisis, what we're seeing is Bashar going to foreign capitals. We see the Beba going to foreign capitals because they're aware that the deciding factor will not be the Libyan people. The deciding factor will be money. It will be foreign capitals. And it appears that that's also how Washington now is approaching this with its negotiations between the various parties, trying to come to some sort of agreement between them. The Libyans are essentially fodder. And I think that even if an agreement comes about, there will be no accountability for it because the reality is that nobody truly cares amongst the stakeholders uh, over the Libyans. And I think that was abundantly clear when they collectively came together to prevent elections from taking place the Beba and Haftar together, they collectively agreed that elections was not in their best interest because they fear that if you give the Libyans a choice, they will eliminate all of these sideline, all of these politicians, and new faces will emerge. And what we're seeing now is this collective agreement that elections might not be ideal, but perhaps we can come to an agreement as to a show of elections that at least facilitates an avenue for the international community to recognize these individual fiefdoms, and we can operate Libya based on that, similar to the way that the international community approaches Iraq, similar to the way it might approach Syria soon, and similar to the way that it approaches other nations around the world. And that's the tragedy of Libya. Sami Hamdi from the International Interest. Thank you, Sami.